Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another fabulous ETAC conference day. I have the great pleasure to introduce Beryl Exley this morning. To say that Beryl is an experienced teacher who now lectures in English and Literacy Education at Griffith University is to grossly understate her contribution to our profession. Her generosity in judging our own short story comp competition in the primary years for the last 10 years and her regular, uh, her regular um, contribution to uh, journals that are important to us, like English in Australia and sometimes to our Word Wordsworth magazine, a very important part of our professional learning. If you are, though, lucky, as I have been to have a, had a closer association with Beryl, you will know her to be incredibly kind, thoughtful and wise in how she goes about the business of being a teacher and a leader of English teachers in this state. Her thoughtful, practical approach to research has shaped the understandings of many of us in this room and I hope that you will very much enjoy her presentation today. You're going to be listening to Beryl talk about spelling, a topic about which I know embarrassingly little. There are always so many things on my list of things to do better in my workplace and spelling really is always one of them. So I am very much looking forward to hearing Beryl tell me about all of the great things that I need to start doing at school. Please welcome Beryl. There will be time for some questions afterwards, so get those in your head and um, have a great session. Good morning everybody and thank you so much to the ETAC committee for the very generous invitation to speak to you today. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet. And I think when we come together in a special place like this, it's really important that we actually understand something about the Indigenous history. And today we're on the beautiful Brisbane River, the Brisbane River which was a, um, a source of food, but also a place of gathering, a place of conversations, and a place of dreaming for the Indigenous custodians of the land. Brisbane, of course, was crossover country where many different tribes came together in this space, including the Tarabal, Yagara and Guppy Guppy's people. Those of you who are a bit more familiar with Brisbane, or those of you who have visited us to Brisbane, might know that there's a special point of land where the Brisbane River turns. It's where QUT is based today, and that has the name Mianjin, Mianjin Point, which is the Indigenous word for Brisbane. And some of you would be familiar with the wonderful literary publication that comes out of um, University of Queensland, um, the, the journal itself called Mianjin as well. One of our city cats is called Mianjin and you'll notice that the spelling of Mianjin actually changes because it was always an oral tradition to say the word Mianjin rather than something that was always spelt and so there's this imposition of Western ways of doing language and literacy that has been imposed upon the Indigenous culture. So let's pause and reflect on um, um, the hopes and the visions of Indigenous Australia as well. Okay, I wrote the title all by myself. <laughs> <laughs> and um, to help you get into the spirit of the title, I thought I would ask you to read it to me. So I'll count you in. We'll say one, two, three, and then we'll all read it together. One, two, three. <laughs> now there's something really interesting happening there, isn't there? Not one of you have ever seen those words written like that before, and yet so many of you were able to chorus um, what I had written with my own quite invented spelling technique. I'd like you to turn and talk to somebody beside you about what you see happening there in terms of the sound symbol relationships. And then I will try and then rein you all back in in about a minute's time. Off you go. <laughs> my water bottle. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I think yeah. this will be the last thing. <laughs> you, you've literally been a handbag today. <laughs> Okay, thanks everyone. 
everybody. Okay, how am I going up there in the back row? Is that a bit better? Thank you. Okay, see now if I need to use my playground voice. Okay, I'm hopeful that by the end of the presentation you will have um, some learned answers to that little um, quandary that I have given you as well. Now, being a speller, it's a hard game, isn't it? And I have to say that um, I certainly don't call myself a perfect speller or a brilliant speller. You know how sometimes you'll see um, those spelling bee shows and young children will stand up and spell words that we've never heard of, they've never heard of, and they've just got this amazing capacity to spell those sorts of words. I was never that sort of speller, and um, I've also got somebody in the audience, Mrs Brennan, who was my um, high school English teacher, um, would certainly not remember me as um, uh, one of those talented spellers. Spelling's really hard work. And the English language is the most difficult language that we can um, uh, try and teach some, uh, something about the way that the sounds and the symbols operate in that. I'd like you to turn and talk to somebody um, with this particular provocation in mind. Let's assume that you were 16 years of age and you were preparing for something like a high stakes external assessment, which is what we're preparing our students for from 2020. And you're preparing your students to be independent spellers. What advice would your English teacher have given you about your spelling when you were 16? session and I ask people for feedback, I'll tell you the sorts of things that we hear a lot of, where people are told, um, try harder, um, pay more attention, <laughs> um, learn more words, but it really is such a tall order. So what I wanted to do today was talk through some of the problems with the English language and my purpose there is to give you an appreciation of why it is so difficult for young children to master the task of spelling. I also wanted to talk through 12 strategies that don't involve the purchase of a commercial spelling program or, <laughs> um, or worksheets um, or something that actually hands over the full responsibility to the adolescents that you're working with. I wanted to um, pitch some of those strategies at the lower end where I know that you've got some children who are very capable in other ways but they may be struggling with the sound symbol relationships of spelling. And I also wanted to talk about spellers at the upper end because I've got this sense that something happens where spelling doesn't get taught or doesn't get scaffolded as much as it probably should in the secondary school years. And I'm not just pointing the finger at English school teachers. I think it's incumbent upon teachers from all the disciplinary fields to teach the particular language patterns that are the means of communication within their disciplinary field. My focus is not going to be on marks out of 10. My focus is definitively going to be on spelling behaviours because that's what marks the stages of spelling. Now, there's a few problems, and the first problem is the lack of fidelity in the English sound symbol system. Now, if we were teaching a language, for example, like Italian or Spanish, we would have an alphabet, and that alphabet would have fidelity between the way that the letters are written and the sounds that they're making, okay? And as a teacher, a primary school teacher of English curriculum, that would give me no end of pleasure because I would be able to teach um, a cognitive code breaking system for reading, 
which were then extended into my cognitive code breaking system for teaching children how to spell. And I would be excellent at that. <laughs> but that's not the job we have before us. The job we have before us is working with this sound symbol system that has quite a bastardised history. It comes from so many different languages that we actually have different ways of patterning those sounds within the language. And for those of you who are into numbers, here's the harsh reality. In the English alphabet, we have 26 letters. And don't forget, not all languages that use the English alphabet system have 26 letters. For example, if you're working with Pacifica students, um, I'm thinking here of the Samoan alphabet, where there are 16 letters in that alphabet. So it could be that you're working with EALD students who come from an alphabet system that to you looks English, but actually has a very different um, sets of choices for making patterns in the sound symbol combinations. So here's the maths. We've got 26 letters that together make 44 phonemes. That's the technical words for sounds. Um, when we're thinking about the way sounds are made, we often use the International Phonetics Alphabet, and this is the way that we represent the, the, the sorts of sounds that children can make, both with their mouth and how they make those sounds, with their tongue and with the breath in or the breath out or the mouth open or the mouth closed, and what they do there with um, whether they've got teeth or haven't got teeth, depending if they're seven years of age. Um, and we use the full range of those 44 phonemes. Now, here's the hard part. There are 120 different choices for pulling those 44 phonemes together. And that is why spelling is a thinking task rather than a rote task. It is very difficult to remember all of those idiosyncrasies across the sorts of words that we want children to be able to write. Now, I'm going to get you to do some um, choral reading here because you're English teachers and I know you love it. <laughs> and we're going to have a look at a very well-known poem um, called Chaos. And the purpose of that poem is to have a look at some of the complications around the sound symbol system of English. So I'm going to divide you into categories here. We might just sort of split you up the middle. Gary, can you put your hand up for us? Okay, if you're on that side of Gary, you're going to start. We'll call you group one. If you're on this side of Gary, we'll call you group two. And you're going to take line about. So group one will take line one, then we'll move on to line two, line three, line four. And, and we'll just keep going. Okay, so I'll count you in, and then we'll start. Ready, group one? Okay, one, two, three, and go. further on as well. Let's just backtrack there. We've got that word lock, lock. You know Ned, where Nessie lives? Lock Ness monster? Lock. Okay. Now you might ask, why can't we actually reform the English language? Why can't we just accept that the vocabulary exists there and that we just 
find another way of representing the sound symbol system. You know the same way that the mathematicians changed from imperial to metric measurements? Why can't we just take control of our own, um, take control of our own language and actually develop a fidelity between the sounds and the way that they're written? And there was a project in the 1990s, in the early 1990s, by a group from Britain where they wanted to attempt to standardise the English language and the way that it was presented. And so what we've got here on your right is an example of what they were proposing as the new way of adopting um, an English alphabet and ways of representing it. So there's a, a short snippet from a um, proposed journal article that they had developed within the sciences that shows you their way of bringing that consistency from the sound symbol relationships. Um, and if you've been reading that multitasking and reading that while I've been talking, um, here is the standard English translation on your left-hand side as well. Now, a project such as this is replete with politics because, you see, language doesn't exist without being immersed within a socio-cultural context. And once we start talking about language as a socio-cultural representation, we start to understand the importance of accents and variations of dialect and ways words get pronounced as well. And that then begs the question, if we're going to adopt something universal, if we're going to adopt something that is going to have consistency throughout the globe, which version of English do we pick up and use? Should we be picking up American English? Should we be picking up... <laughs> oh, that was a rhetorical question, but I, <laughs> but I do appreciate your answer. <laughs> Should we be picking up British English? Or will we like the whole world to pick up the Australian draw? Or should we be identifying which version of English actually has the most number of speakers and picking up that one? And if that's the case, if we went with numbers as being the weight of the decision, we would actually be speaking the version of English called Chinglish, which is Chinese English. There are more speakers of English in China alone than there are the rest of the English-speaking world combined. So if we were going to adopt a standardised global way of speaking and writing English, you might like to be careful what you wish for. Okay, there's another problem around the teaching of spelling and that is the problem of teacher knowledge. There's not been a lot of research done around the teaching of spelling or the teacher's knowledge because other things have taken priority. Um, but we do know that a study done in 2007 by Western Australian teachers, by Mean and Hammond, found that only 7% of the people who participated in the survey felt that they were well prepared to teach spelling. And that's interesting, isn't it? 7%. That's not a whole lot of people. If you think of 100 teachers lined up, and 7% felt well prepared to teach it. When um, Jeff Masters was employed by Education Queensland um, to identify why Queensland had failed the NAPLAN race, um, he offered three pieces of advice back to Anna Bly, who at the time was the Education Minister. His first piece of advice was more testing. His second piece of advice was um, practice testing. And his third piece of advice was test the teachers. And we've actually seen that advice not only extend throughout Queensland, it's extended throughout AITSL with the um, initial um, literacy and numeracy test for initial teacher education students, um, affectionately known as land tight. And that, <laughs> and that has been implemented as of last year for as a graduation requirement for all early childhood primary and secondary school teachers, regardless of their disciplinary field. Now within that, one of the components is um, spelling. There's a component of um, syntax and grammar, which certainly interests me. A uh, um, component there around word usage and one around text organisation. Um, we could talk about land height and its efficacy for, for quite some time, 
But in the spirit of um, Jeff Master's recommendations, how about we have a bit of a spelling test right now? <laughs> so if you could um, pull out a piece of paper or maybe just pull out a notes function on your phone with the spelling function disabled. <laughs> um, it, it won't be a long test. There's only five items. So if you could list the numbers one to five down the left-hand side of your page, please. Okay, first word, palate. I burnt the palate of my mouth. Spell the word palate. And if you could cover your word, thank you. <laughs> Second word, palate. The artist burnt his painting palate. Spell the word palate. Third word, Palette. We touched the bonfire with a wooden palette, and if you're not sure, you can sound it out. <laughs> Number four, xylem. Xylem is a fibrovascular tissue bundle in plants. Spell the word xylem. And here's a word you've seen many times before, millennium. The new millennium brought new agendas. Spell the word millennium. Now, what if I ask you to swap books? <laughs> <laughs> There's probably a lot of good reasons that you could think of for not doing that, yes? Um, and, and look, we know there's actually good reasons for not doing that because I, identifying your own errors is actually a very sophisticated way of improving your own practice as well. How about um, we don't have a roll call, we don't give a mark out of 10. How about I let you have a look at the correct answers and think for yourself why you might have made some of the decisions that you made and why some of the correct spelling patterns uh, might exist in the way that they do. Here are the answers. were actually talking about um, etymology. They were talking about the foundations of those words. Just affirm for me by nodding, yes. That you were talking about, of course, it's a French word. Of course, it's talking about something, yes. <laughs> it's talking about something cultural. And when we know that we've got those sound patterns in that particular language, we know that it gets represented usually in this way rather than this way. So knowing something about etymology is a way of making really good decisions about which written representations you will bring to bear for the spelling requirements of a word. I'm also hoping by the time you got down to sentence number four, you were thinking, that's not a word that I use very often in English, but that is certainly a word that would be quite customary in, for example, the field of science. And a lot of science words come from Greek words. And in the Greek alphabet, the z, z sound is not made by the letter Z, but is made by the letter X. OK, and millennium, just knowing how many L's and how many N's and how many N's in that word. And thinking about a way that that can pattern, not based purely on phonetics, because phonetics doesn't really help us to spell that word, um, I'm wondering how many of you actually scribbled it down to three different ways and then from there identified something that visually looked standard. Okay, so my purpose there was to open up the conversations about spelling behaviours. 
and how it is this repertoire of spelling behaviours that is really important for developing a competent speller. And I'm going to use the word competent rather than the word perfect. I think developing perfect spellers is a tall ask. What we want is competent spellers who can then bring other strategies on top of that, including a care factor. <laughs> we are working with teenagers. <laughs> but also being, having that care factor to actually then want to get the word right. Okay, can you, can you see how I'm thinking of spelling as something that is scaffolded? And it's the behaviours that are scaffolded and it's the range of behaviours that are brought to bear that create what we would think of as competent and confident spellers. Okay, problem three. And this is where I feel for you guys. Who is responsible for teaching spelling knowledge? And I know the conversations that happen in staff rooms with a maths teacher or the science teacher waltzes into the staff room and sighs very dramatically and says, what do you people teach in English? <laughs> um, and I guess your response is we teach literature, we teach narrative, we teach historical text, we teach modern text, we teach woman media, we teach moving image, we teach socio-cultural discourse analysis of texts, and we teach about identity, etc., etc., etc. But somewhere in that conversation, I'd really like you to have a voice that says, and we don't teach the specific words that belong in your disciplinary field. That's your job. After all, you are the person best qualified to do that. So should everybody be a literacy teacher? I think the answer there is a resounding yes. And here's the logic. All disciplinary fields use language as the means of communication. If we didn't have language as a means of communication, we wouldn't have any communication within the disciplinary field. So all disciplinary fields need to take responsibility for the specificities of that communication. It would be a very unusual day as an English teacher that I was using words that purely belonged in maths and science education. They come from particular heritages and they also orientate towards particular written representations of sound patterns that aren't altogether common within my disciplinary field. That is why every teacher should be a teacher of literacy. Now this was the grand remit of Education Queensland going back some time ago. Do you remember Literacy, the Key to the Future and the Literate Futures and, and all of that PD that ran out? Moderately successful in the primary school years, mainly because the person who teach, teaches maths and teaches science is also the English teacher. So they get things around orientation to text. They get things around seize the moment to talk about word structures and spelling patterns. But when the literacy, the key to learning, PD ran out for secondary schools and was, teachers were split into their disciplinary fields, there was, shall we say, less than enthusiastic uptake by some, some fields. And I think that was a shame. I think it was a golden opportunity to do that. And I was talking with Julie Arnold this morning that part of that reason might be because the task that was required of those teachers wasn't given enough time to actually bed that down. And teachers will only teach what they feel confident with. And I get that. I'm wondering whether the... Um, the literacy, the key, the key to learning professional development simply wasn't substantive enough, long-term enough, didn't go back in and follow teachers into the classroom to then scaffold them through the next level of that development. We also know that a lot of that PD focused on macro textual orientation, um, genre, and those sorts of things, and that spelling wasn't a large part of that as well. So, Whilst you're bearing the brunt of those sides from those teachers from the other disciplinary fields, also be mindful that um, they themselves possibly have not been served well enough with substanti substantial professional development around um, the teaching of spelling. Okay, problem four. New literacies for new times. I thought you'd like that one. <laughs> Okay, okay, tough audience, that's okay. 
Um, the other thing that I was just going to mention is that so much of the advertising seems to be playing with, playing with words, the same way that I played with words in my opening slide. But there's a problem with this, and that is the power of the visual. We know that when we see a word spelled incorrectly often enough, that we start to second guess what is the correct visual representation. Now, I've been a primary school teacher for, um, working within the primary field of teacher education for 33 years, and I can tell you I've lost count of the number of times I've seen the word school spelled S-K-O-L, and there was one moment there where I actually forgot how to start the word. <laughs> I, it, it didn't occur to me that it had a C in there. And I just had, you know that pregnant pause that you have? Where you, where you think, my goodness me, I've, I've actually lost track of how to spell that word for a moment. And then I was able to get myself back on track. The power of the visual, there's two really important learnings we can take from this. Number one is, children are exposed to a lot of incorrectly spelt words in social media through the advertising, and dare I say, on teachers' chalkboards. And also, because spelling phonetically is sometimes a cool thing to do when you're actually masking your lack of confidence with your own spelling. Okay, this is an exercise to show you how very powerful the visual is in terms of imprinting across the brain around words. So I'm going to get you to participate in this one as well, but here's the instruction. Do not read the words. Can we say that again? <laughs> Do not read the words. I want you to say the colour of each word. Now, just so we don't have a punch up, <laughs> how about we agree to call this one mustard? Okay, <laughs> mustard. Okay. I think and I'm not interested in light blue, light green, dark blue, dark green type thing. We'll just, we'll just give it one now, okay? Do you think we're ready? Okay, so don't read the word, say the colour. One, two, three, go. Red, strategy we can take from that. The visual is very powerful for remembering words. And those of you who have had young children and you've had the pleasure of being in early childhood classrooms, I just want to make a comparison here. Have you noticed how print saturated early childhood classrooms are? You know how as you walk in the room you've, you've got to duck, you know, duck from all the mobiles and you've just got to move sideways around things? and everything's got a label on it, and it's always written beautifully, it's always written purposefully, and it's actually a point of learning for young children. And I'm wondering what there we can actually take into our secondary school classrooms about creating print-rich environments that mean something to the children that are in those classrooms as well. It's not just about filling spaces, it's actually about providing stimulus and providing resources for children. I know as a youngster, as a 10-year-old, I learned to spell the word library because the window that I looked at had the library building beside it. And I thought, wow, so there's two hours there, hey? <laughs> and, and I've never forgotten that because I've had that constant visual reminder. Okay, problem five. The most common strategy that novice spellers use is to sound out. And yet that is the least effective strategy for getting words right. And the reason is that the English language is more morphophonological than phonological, which is quite hilarious when you think that the word morphophonological is made up of more things, and that's what I'm talking about here. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so what it's saying is that the English language is less predictable if we try and sound it out 
but more predictable if we try and look for the little words within the big words. And that's what a morpheme is. A morpheme is a little word. Okay? So if we have a look at the word morphophonological, we can, we can see little words within that. Now, spelling rules have exceptions. There's about 150 to 200 spelling rules if you want to get them all correct, which in my mind is way too many rules to learn. I suggest that we narrow the number of rules down to just a few that I think are reasonably useful. But every time we teach a rule, there's always a long list of exceptions as well. So I always preface a rule with usually or sometimes, never with the definitive always. Okay, let's meet Brian. Now, um, I think this is a really important reminder about how complicated rules can be. I'm not suggesting you share this YouTube clip with children. There's a bit in there that um, some of... Mm, yeah, um, some of you may not like, but I think it does give us a good reminder about how complicated it is. So let's, let's just see if I can get the technology to work. Um. I don't know. I'd be a lot better off if I would have studied more when I was growing up, you know? But you know where it all went wrong was the day they started the spelling bee. Because up until that day I was an idiot, but nobody else knew. Oh. I don't know. I'd be a lot better off if I would have studied more when I was growing up, you know? But you know where it all went wrong was the day they started the spelling bee. Because up until that day I was an idiot, but nobody else knew, you know? And the spelling bee day, you know, popped up. All right, kids, up against the wall. It's time for public humiliation. <laughs> Spell a word wrong, sit down in front of your friends. You know, that's great for little egos. Hey, look at me, I'm a moron. <laughs> I wasn't even close. I was using numbers and stuff. <laughs> that's why I admired that kid who spelled it wrong on purpose so he could sit down, you know? He knew he wasn't gonna win, so why stand there for three hours? First round, cat, K-A-T, I'm out of here. <laughs> Then as he passed you, <laughs> I know there's two T's. <laughs> I remember my teacher asked me, Brian, what's the I before E roll? Um, I before E. Always. <laughs> what are you, an idiot, Brian? Well, apparently. So she explains it, no, Brian, it's I before E, except after C. And when sounding like A is a neighboring way. And on weekends and holidays and all throughout May, and you'll always be wrong no matter what you say. <laughs> it's a hard rule. It's a rough rule. Plurals were hard, too. Brian, how do you make a word a plural? You put an S. You put an S at the end of it. When? <laughs> On weekends and holidays. <laughs> no, Brian, no, let me show you. So she asked this kid who knew everything, Erwin. Erwin, Erwin, what is he plural for ox? Oxen. The farmer used his oxen. Brian, what? <laughs> Brian, what's the plural for box? Boxing. <laughs> I bought two boxes of donuts. <laughs> no, Brian, no. Let's try another one. Erwin, what is he plural for? Goose, geese. I saw a flock of geese. Brian, what? Brian, what's the plural for? Moose. Moosin'. I saw a flock of moosin'. There are many of them, many much moose in. Out in the woods, in the wood is, in the woods in. The meat's wanting the food, food is the eating is it. The meat's wanting food and in the wood again is it. And the food in the wood in is it. Brian, Brian. You're an imbecile. Imbecile. You speak in German, Brian? German, Germain, Germain, Jackson. Jackson 5, Tito, 
Brad, what the hell are you talking about? No, no, really. I think there's an important reminder there for us as teachers. We probably all know O'Brien, and we probably all know what Brian's been through. And it's not an easy place for Brian to be at, but what can we do to scaffold him through it that doesn't involve the public humiliation around spelling being something that's memorised, spelling being something that focuses on marks out of 10 or something like that. So we're going to talk about some strategies that can help students like Brian, but also help students at the top end. Okay, problem seven. This is the one that really concerns me because this is the one that's been forced upon us, but it's also something that we could do something about. And that's the conflict between the ACARA ACE, the Australian Curriculum English, and NAPLAN testing as well. You see, NAPLAN asks young children to do something that is not a requirement of the Australian Curriculum, and that is edit somebody else's work. Editing your own work is one skill that we want to encourage the children to do, and rightly so. But editing somebody else's work is usually a skill reserved for an adult editor. Because we quite don't know what they were thinking about when they were pulling their sound letter combinations together. Yet NAPLAN, and this goes right back to grade three, also in grade five, definitely in grade seven and grade nine, has spelling in two parts. We have language conventions, um, which has a subset on spelling, and then we also have spelling assessed in the free writing task, which, sorry, it's not really free writing, is it? It's constrained on demand writing on a topic you've had no opportunity to know anything about. But anyhow, that's another presentation. Sounding like stupid all now. <laughs> okay. Here's some really interesting research that came from um, Alan Gardner and Lee Willett um, back in 2009. And what was really interesting that they made this research available to ACARA and ACARA still does nothing about it. And that is what they call the distraction factor. When language conventions are assessed through NAPLAN, children are given this stimulus, and here's an example of a stimulus. This isn't the one they did their research on, but this was one that I pulled off the net from 2011, because that was the last year that NAPLAN tests were available to the public. Um, there's a picture of a guitar, and you can see that there are some incorrectly spelt words. They've been circled, they've been identified for the students as the words that need to be fixed up as well. And Alan and Lee were quite concerned about this distracting factor. When we see words spelled incorrectly, it's hard to think about how things could be otherwise. You know, it's kind of like the zippity do da zippity day song. Once you get it in your head, you can't get it out of your head. It's, you can thank me for that later. <laughs> um, it, it's a bit like that. So what they did was they went out into schools and they assessed children in grades three, five, seven, and nine on what they had done in um, their NAPLAN language convention spelling editing task. And then four to six weeks later, they went back and did a dictation test with the same target words in them. Now, you could argue that maybe four to six weeks wasn't long enough for there to be a period where you could be absolutely certain that there was no shadows of those previous experiences. But let's assume that that was the case. They found that when children were given the words orally in a dictation sentence and they had a blank piece of paper in front of them where they didn't have those incorrect visual distractors, that 75% of them had more words correct. Isn't that telling? That's really, really interesting when we're looking at children's NAPLAN marks, but also, I want to go back to a comment that I made previously. When children are given incorrect spelling, both through social media, through advertising, and I'm going to say it again because I, I, I think there's a certain reality attached to it, when teachers don't spell correctly on the board, okay, that, um, we are giving the children a resource that isn't serving them well. 
Okay, problem eight, and this is the last problem. I'll then sort of um, move on to some more positive things, which are some strategies. Promulgating the myth of a sound symbol relationship. And I want to start here with um, an anecdote. Does anybody remember the ants on the apple? Ants on the apple? The letter A says? So ants on the apple, at, at, at. Ants on the apple, at, at, at. Ants on the apple, at, at. The letter A says at. Well, can you write down this word for me? It's my daughter's name. I'll spell it for you. A L I C I A. You see, it's spelt the French way. And she likes it because it's got two little dots in it, which when you're a 16-year-old girl, you can turn into love hearts. <laughs> and like that really matters. <laughs> um, wasn't the reason we chose the name, but anyhow. When she was in preschool, she went through a program where she was taught the letter A says at. And even as a five-year-old, she came home and she said to me, Mummy, in my name, the letter A doesn't say at. It says a. Ah. And can you imagine the wonderful conversation we could then have about let's listen for the sounds and let's think about all the, way that, all the ways that that sound can be written, okay? But we've actually got this commodity out there in the community where parents who are very well intentioned, sometimes very well resourced as well, have only got access to commodities that teach them that letters have sounds. And that is a fallacy. Letters do not have sounds, okay? Sounds get written by letters. I'll say that again because that's an important difference that will help struggling spellers. Letters do not have sounds. Is that a shock to anyone here? Letters do not have sounds? Okay, I'll say the second part. Sounds have letters. Sometimes sounds have a few letters. Sometimes they have a couple of letters. Sometimes they do have one letter, but sometimes they've actually got up to seven different ways that the same sound can be written. And we'll meet some of those today as well. Alicia went to preschool in the second week where she learnt bulls are bouncing, but, but, but. Bulls are bouncing, but, but, but. The letter B says, but. Wasn't so much of a problem. Little did she know that um, sometimes you can have B and B together, like bubble, and that still makes but. Um, but week three was another problem. Caterpillars coughing, k, k, k. Caterpillars coughing, k, k, k. The letter C says, k. And she said, but mummy, in my name, the letter C doesn't say k, it says shh. Now, she was a little bit wrong because technically it's the C and the I go together to make the shh sound in French. But, you know, she was only five and, <laughs> um, and she was doing okay. She was actually understanding something that takes children a long time to understand, mainly because of the commodities they've been given, but the fact that nobody's actually told them from the beginning that letters don't make sounds. Now, there's my daughter um, on the right, and here's her cousin, who was born at much the same time. Her cousin's father was Italian, and she got the lovely Italian name Antonella. Even if you've never heard that name before, and I ask you to write it down, you could probably get a pretty good approximation of that because Italian has got this lovely fidelity between the sounds and the symbols that we bring together. There is really only one way to write Antonella. Alicia, on the other hand, And we didn't actually realise how many different ways you could spell Alicia. It took, you know when you have a baby and then people send you all the um, welcome, welcome to baby cards? We didn't realise how many different ways there were to spell Alicia. And um, so we named our third child Luke. And, <laughs> and there's only one way to spell Luke. Um, um, <laughs> okay, well, way back then there was only one way to spell Luke. Um, and... Alicia also had another moment of reckoning. When she was um, in grade one, she went to a birthday party. And when she went to say goodbye to the host, the host said, oh, on the back table there are all the little party bags. You know, children get little party bags to take home? And she said, yours will have your name on it. And um, Alicia sort of waltzed off. You know, she'd been able to recognise her name for her preschool year. And so grade one, she was able to recognise her name as well. And there wasn't... Um, a, a little bag that was written the way she expected it to be written. 
It was actually written a different way. And so we were able to take that bag home and we could talk about how that different written representation still had all the sounds in it, but it had used different letters to make the same sounds. And that was just such a rich learning experience to have at a point that really mattered. It was a point where she was stressed over whether it was or wasn't her particular bag. Okay, so here's the problem. 26 letters that make 44 phonemes or sounds through 120 combinations. And I wanted to labour another point. Children may not meet those 120 combinations until they get to the set of vocabulary words that get met in the secondary school years. You see, primary school teachers can't teach the lot because there's certain words that don't get taught, in, that they, they don't have a reason to be in the primary school sector. They don't have a, a sense of meaning. They're not taught within the fray of practice in primary school. And that is why spelling needs to be continued to be scaffolded through the secondary years and within the disciplinary fields. Okay, so here are some strategies. Strategy one, teaching students how to spell, not what to spell. Teaching students that it's okay to think about spelling. It's okay not to have automatic recall. It's actually okay to pause and ponder over the next phone in within a word. It's okay to write the word a couple of times and use your visual literacy skills to determine which word is standard. Because spelling is a thinking process, not a rote task. And there's many reasons why I would strongly discourage you from seeing spelling as a rote task. <coughs> we can't possibly teach the 75,000 words that a competent and confident speller needs to know before they leave high school. We simply, you know, there's only so many words you can teach when you're doing 10 to 20 lists, um, 10 to 20 word lists each week. We also know that that builds short-term recall, and short-term recall is, you know, when all said and done, pretty useless. How many of you learnt spelling lists for four days? Come four weeks later, you couldn't remember those words again. Okay, strategy two. The basis of the spelling program has to include four spelling knowledges, and here they are. So learning to spell is not a list of words, it's a process of learning to apply different spelling knowledges appropriately. And I'm going to go through these in order. The first one is phonological. Phono, of course, meaning sound. Logical, meaning logical. <laughs> so it's phonological is sound logic. And that's where we look at the sound relationships. The most common strategy that is taught and the least effective strategy for getting words right. The second strategy is visual. This is where we remember something about the visual features of a word. We might remember the shape of the word or we might remember it's got two L's together in the middle like millennium and only one L at the end. We might remember, for example, the word liaison has got an I either side of the A. Okay? There might be something visual that we remember about the word. A pretty good strategy to rely on but again, not the most effective. The most effective, um, the most effective strategy, I've just realised how ironic is this, I've got a spelling mistake in the next one. <laughs> um, that should be morphophonological. That's the parts of the word that build into word families. This is when we're looking at a tricky word and we say to the students, do we know parts of these words? You see, if we can Break down a word into its small themes, that means we break it down into its smallest unit that makes sense in English. If we can break a word down to more themes, we can then apply the rules that we know about adding suffixes and prefixes and those sorts of things as well. If we can't identify the morpheme, we're then guessing what might happen when we're adding those suffixes. You know, whether we do or don't drop the E, whether we do or don't double the last consonant, those sorts of things. Etymological is also a very good strategy 
but it actually requires a different knowledge base from the teacher to actually be word curious, to care about where words come from, and to use it as a discovery activity in class. I wonder where that word comes from, and I wonder what those bits of those words mean, because I haven't met them before, and I'm just a bit unsure. Or maybe I'm a bit confused, or maybe I've got a couple of options there. Morphology and etymology are only introduced in the last year of primary school, grade six. So you can see the children haven't had a long apprenticeship in morphology and etymology before they get to you in grade seven. Okay, strategy three. Effective teachers have always used systematic observation and recording as a means of assessment. And if you really wanted to make a difference to um, spelling in the high school, there is one book I could commend to you. It costs about $30, which I think is a fabulous resource. It's called Spelling Recovery. Um, you probably can't see it there. It's written by Jan Roberts, R-O-B-E-R-T-S. You can buy it on the internet. And what it does is it teaches you how to identify spelling behaviours. So what you do is on the left hand side here of the list, you write down 10 words that a child has got incorrect from a free writing task. And then you actually um, plot it on this array to determine whether there is um, an over-reliance on phonetics, whether it needs to become a sight word, whether it's an incorrect application of a rule or something like that. So I won't go into too much detail about that because that, that would be a whole workshop in and of itself. But what I could commend you to is this resource. It's, I think it's an easy read. It gives you some case studies of um, teenage students who struggle with spelling. And it's the sort of thing that I did when I was a grade six classroom teacher and I had children who were struggling with spelling. I pulled up a piece of free writing. You've only got to identify the first 10 errors that they make. And the idea is that if you identify the first 10 errors, you get almost enough about the sorts of patterning mistakes that they're making that you can then make decisions about what spelling behaviours they're over-relying upon and what spelling behaviours you need to introduce next. So that's a fantastic resource to take into the secondary school. Strategy four, scaffold students to discover the letter patterns that match a single phoneme. Now, I'm going to show you what we do in the primary school years here. Um, this would be a strategy that you could work with if you find yourself in the situation of working with um, somebody who's not confident around spelling. So if you could pick up the similar sort of scaffolding patterns that we use in the primary school years, I think the children will recognise it and I think that would give you a good point um, that you can move forward from. Okay, so I'm going to take a book that I would use in the early years. It's um, a lovely book um, by Pamela Allen called Mr McGee. And Mr McGee is a fellow who lives by himself and he's a little bit hapless. But um, the reason I've chosen this is because there's actually... Um, this plethora of sound repetition within the text. So bear with me as I read it to you. Um, this morning he was feeling grumpy. He made the porridge and it was lumpy. He put two sugars in his tea, then spilt the lot and burnt his knee. Did you hear what I heard? I heard lots of E sounds there. Did you hear them all? And so what, what, what I would do with the students is we would put on our listening ears and we would go on a sound hunt. Okay, we'd go on a sound hunt and we would say the word slowly and we would see if we could find the E sound. Then when we find the E sound, we have a look to see which letters pattern together to make the E sound. And look at this great big list that we came up with. Look at that from that little tiny stanza of that poem, we came up with mucky, he, feeling, grumpy, lumpy, tea and knee. And so we learn that there's lots and lots of different ways of patterning for the letter E. We also go back and we practice trying on for size. You know how, um, I know guys don't do this generally, but ladies, you know how when you go in and you try something on for size? Okay, we go and do that sort of thing. So. 
We take all of our little phoneme cards, our double E, our single E, our EA, our Y, which sometimes makes an E sound, sometimes doesn't, but sometimes does. And we actually try them in those gaps so that we can start seeing how words pattern. And we also learn things that if we want an E sound at the end, it might be a Y, but we also, if we want an E sound at the front, I don't think I can think of any word where it starts with a Y at the front and it makes the E sound. You can? Oh, E Z. Five minutes. Okay. Okay, strategy five, teacher modelling. I think this is something you can do in your lessons really easily. You know, you know if you're a poor speller, you actually think that the whole world can spell except for you. And then when teachers stand at the front of the board and they just rattle off all these great big words and they spell them with ease, why don't you actually model the metacognitive processes that go with thinking about spelling? So you're sta standing in front of the board and you actually pause or you stall and you think out loud. That's actually very comforting for students. Strategy six, building automaticity with high frequency words. Now, you don't need this list. This was just a list that I Googled. But if you just Google the 100 most frequently used words in the English language, you'll actually find that this list is made up of, generally speaking, very short words. Words that often get misspelt by um, novice spellers. And these words tend to get used about 75% of the time. So if we can have high levels of automaticity with these basic words, we can then get the students struggling less over words like the and they and water and because, and then that way they can put their energy into the words that are new or are more uncommon as well. And there's lots of ways that you can build that automaticity, often through games such as um, old maid, snap, bingo, splash man, something like that. So you go to the cheap shops, you buy a, a bunch of um, playing cards that are blank and you write one word on each of those and just think of games that you can play with them. Okay, here's a strategy that comes from another North Queensland teacher. Um, uh, Pat Donnelly from Mackay came up with this strategy called DART and I love it. So when he's in a classroom space and children are doing some free writing, and they're stumped by a particular word, Pat doesn't give them the answer. He asks them to have a go. Have a go, show me what you can do. And rather than telling them how to fix up the word and get the word right, he just meets them halfway, he gives them a hint. He either says the letter D, A, R or T to them, and it's code. If the student has spelled a word incorrectly because they've deleted, or sorry, they've added one letter too many, he will just say D, which means delete something. Go back, look at your word and take one thing out. But he hands over the responsibility to the student to do that. If they've written the word incorrectly because they've left one letter out, he will just simply say A, which means go and add something. Go back, look at your word and you work out what you've got to add. He will, um, if they've got um, two letters that are mixed up, he will just say R, uh, which means rearrange two of those letters. Or if they've got to pull out a phoneme and replace it with another phoneme, you know, before I showed you the list of E phonemes, um, they know that they've actually got to pull out a phoneme and replace it with something else. Now, it might be that the children need a couple of goes to actually get that word right. But this is an example of how you can turn spelling into a thinking process rather than a rote memorisation process as well. I was going to get you to do an example, but I won't do that. Okay, syllables are also really important. Syllables are ways for breaking down the word to make sure that the student hears all of the sounds within words. Now, a syllabus is different to a morpheme because a syllabus is based on... Um, sounds where a vowel is the nucleus, okay? Every syllable has to have a vowel. And the easy way to test the syllables is to put your hand under your chin, and as you say the word, your mouth will drop, your jaw will drop, and hit your hand every time you get to a syllable. And that is because 
the only time we open our mouth wide is when we're making a vowel sound. So if you think about it, A, E, I, O, U. Mouth open, jaw drops. Okay? All of our other consonant sounds are made with relatively closed mouths. Okay? Lips relatively close together or lips closed. Okay? With an explosion of air coming through that space. Like B, P, K, D, M, M, S. See the difference? So if you want to help children spell with syllables, get them to do things like this. Kang, ga, ru. Okay, can you see how you're actually breaking it up for them? And it actually helps them to think about little bits instead of thinking about the whole big bit. Okay, strategy nine. English is um, a vacuum cleaner language. That means it's sucked up language patterns and letter patterns from lots of different languages. And just have been word curious and wanting to know a little bit more about where those words come from so we can start to think about what language patterns might be more common or more popular within um, those words that we're trying to spell. Strategy 10 is caring about the etymology, caring about the history of the language and where it comes from. Now, I don't pretend that we should know the history of every word, but I think it's easy enough to be word curious. And then even saying during a lesson to somebody, actually, I'm not really sure where that word comes from. Do you want to look that up and then tell the rest of the class what you know about that word? Strategy 11, Greek and Latin roots. What a shame. <laughs> What a shame we've lost Greek and Latin roots. Because Greek and Latin roots actually explain a whole lot about the English language. Now, I'm going to focus here specifically on Greek roots and have a look at how Greek roots pattern differently. For example, um, in words that come from that Greek origin, we've got the, um, the sound is often not made by the letter F, but made by the P and the H in words like emphasis, physical. We've also got the K sound made by CH, like chemical, stomach, scheme, technical. And you can see a lot of those words are actually quite technical words that we use in business, biology. Um, and we've also got the U sound as in neurotic, eucalyptus, neutron, made with EU. Now, I'm going to labour the point here that there's a lot of words there that simply don't get explored in primary school. So this is why I'm saying that spelling needs to be brought into the secondary school as well. We've got the or sound, as in nautical, and then we've got the silent P, as in psychic and psalm. Okay, in terms of Latin roots, we've got the C making that sound, as in cell, centre, city, medicine, and look at all of that, science words again. Um, we've got the ch, ch, ch sound being made by the letter G, okay? Not making the G sound, but making the ch, ch, giant, agent, imagine, and original. And then we've got the ch sound being made by T-I-C-I -I or double S-I, as in nation, official, and commission. Okay, last strategy, strategy 12, some spelling rules. Now, I don't have a lot of spelling rules that I roll out. I only roll out just a bit more than a, than a few. But I do like to teach um, making plural nouns. Okay, I think um, Brian taught us a little bit about the problems around plurality. Um, I also do like to teach the I before E rule except after C, and I know that there are exceptions, but remember I said I usually preface that with the word usually, or sometimes, or mostly, rather than always. Um, I also like to teach the silent E rule um, before adding a suffix that begins with a vowel, and this is why morphology is important, because if we can get children to distill down to that, that main morpheme, then they can actually apply this rule before adding the suffix. And it just gives them a scaffold or a structure for thinking about what they do with that E. Do we put the E in? Do we take the E out? You know, engagement, management, lodgement, you know, all those sorts of words. Um, sometimes we leave the E in 
And they are the words that end in soft, C-E or G, as in notice. See how it's soft? It's not a Z sound. Okay, it's a soft S. But that rule comes undone if we actually tend to use um, American and English spelling differently. So we've got to listen for the sounds. Got to listen for the sounds. Okay, um, if the word ends in a silent E, keep the E to add a suffix that begins with a consonant. I like that rule. So this, these are where we make our adverbs and whether we um, have to add the E, leave the E before we do the L-Y. And then the last one, if the word ends in a single vowel followed by a single consonant, you double the consonant to add the suffix beginning with a vowel. Well, there's another way I've heard this rule said. If the second last letter is a short vowel, double the consonant before adding the suffix. Okay, so here are two principles. Number one, okay, actually I probably should say number one, you don't need a commercial spelling program, you don't need worksheets, you don't need book cover, say, write and check. What you need is a principle that good spellers are self-regulating. <coughs> And good spellers are not perfect spellers, but they care. They care about spelling. And number two, spelling is a thinking process, not a rote task. I would never advocate for pulling your spool, poor spellers out and giving them lessons on a Thursday morning, separate from their disciplinary fields. I think that spelling needs to happen, sorry, I believe that spelling needs to happen within the disciplinary field where the words are being explored. Thank you very much, everybody.